sharing um, four of our recent works. We're going to be doing a demo of them. Um, and um, just quickly put into perspective for about a minute. Um, Um, so our organization is called the Sanskrit Research Institute, it's based in Oroville, here to Pondicherry, about 12 kilometers north of Pondicherry. And I'm a graduate a research student um, at ANU, Australian National University. And um, the institute's part of Oroville, um, so it's Indian Institute, and I direct it. It's a lot of fun. And that's where we are, and this is our team, and the um, team is international, um, on and off campus, voluntary, and Terms of some permanent stuff. So. Um, I'm not going to go back on. A, I'm only going to focus on four of the newer works that we've done. But just a recap is that we've worked with educational tools and some research tools with some. Um, we did a dictionary. Um, take took a whole lot. Of, it's a meta dictionary. Took data from many different sources. It was an aid for tertiary students and also secondary and like late secondary students. Uh, it's quite popular. Um, and we keep mod mod modifying and improving it. It has its quirks, like anything, but um, it's in it. And then we've done um, comparative grammars between English and classical. Um, it was really just seeing the gap where things were not were missing, and then not to duplicate things that have already been done really well. And we've made some educational games, and um, um, we've done some things that have already been done before much better. So um, we've had the tools and. Um, one thing that I quite like and it's used is we made a typing tool for touch typing Sanskrit. It uses its own system, but the idea was to basically use the neural maps you have in your brain without teaching something new. And it seems to be quite popular with people who haven't learned an existing system already. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of our um, recent works, basically, that, um, and we've shared them already on Indology and with the Scholarly community. And I'll, I'll dig in a bit of technical detail where, where needed, and obviously in the question time, you can um, hit me with, with technical questions. So, um, number one was, um, we, I surveyed to see if there was a word frequency tool for Sanskrit, and I couldn't find anything that had been published um, and available. Oliver Helmick um, from the BCS had, had done elements, but he hadn't completed it. So we wrote some scripts in Python, and uh, we extracted the snapshot of the DCS, which is in the public domain. That was 3.2 million um, words at the time, which was single-handedly done by one person. It's quite a, I think he deserves some kind of award if we have an award in the conference. <laughs> Actually, it's up to 4 point something million. Um, so I don't know if he sleeps. Um, <laughs> so we extracted it, and then we took the data um, and then we uh, made, made different uh, intuitive ways of looking at it. And this is the live demo. Um, and so you see there's 3.2 million words, 67 uh, unique words. What's defined as a word um, will basically be a stem and a prefix, a stem and a, a root for a verb and a, um, oh, I'm going to make it bigger. That's as big as my screen will get. Um, maybe I can go F11, that'll go one step bigger. That's why I can't do more than F11. Is it, is it legible? No. Yeah, no. Well, I'll send you the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the, the, the DBI of the projector. So, um, we're trying, the objective here was basically to firstly accomplish the task of, of, of doing this, and we had to use a, um, data from somewhere, and DCS is the best data. Um, and um, it has limitations, but it gives you quite useful data for comparative um, frequencies. We've got a Ukrainian scholar now doing a comparison between frequencies in other languages with this data. And um, you can filter it down um, based on um, tagging that we tag the literature, the, the, the corpus that we use. So you could just say in Vedic, and it changes a lot. Things like Agni and Soma Marut will obviously come right up to the top of the box in the Vedic. <coughs> They will lose after the, the late Vedic, they will start to, to be. And you can look at the Buddhist literature and the things like Buddha will obviously come to top of the pops. And um, yeah, there will be gray areas, of course. It, 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 it's not, you can't be very specific because a Buddhist era is, is not something you can measure with a piece of string, but you can generalize and mount the literature from that era. And um, you can also search it. 
Um, if we reset the, you can search for a word if you're particularly, if there's a word you have a fascination with, you know, you can search for the frequency. And we've got some kind of graphing um, over time, but this is in beta, so I do not, um, I do not, um, you can see there's an <laughs> error. So it is in beta, but it, it can be useful. And um, we put it out there, and it's been used. Um, and then you can also filter by a specific text. Now, obviously, he hasn't done the complete all the text. You'll see there's a star if the text is um, incomplete and it's not starred if it's complete. Because Oliver only did things that were of interest to him. Now, I'm, at the end of my presentation, I'll talk about our Moonshot project, uh, which is called Sanskrit Archive. And that will have a lot more than 3.2 million words. That's going to have um, hundreds of millions of words. So, obviously, this will get more accurate. But we already, 3.2 million is not a bad starting point. Um, and it is on our cards to refresh it with the latest DCS data, but it's a lot of work. It's going to be like quite a lot of man hours, so we haven't got around to doing it yet. But it's on the cards, in case you're wondering. Um, and you can you can filter by author, by subject, um, and you can also filter by part of speech here, yes, if, if, if you want, basically, based on how the data was tagged. So we just say noun. We don't go into the case. So, yeah, it's out there, and you can play with it. Um, probably a few of you already know about it. Um, and if you don't, please go and give us some feedback. And um, the second one we did which was um, also, yeah, now Oliver once again had really done this, but he'd made a Windows desktop tool that couldn't operate in an automated way. Now, the bigger project that I'm working on needs an automated OCR engine. So initially I tried to automate a Windows tool running through a script and sending data in and out. And it just was, it was just pl pludging it, just um, <coughs> clunking and pludging. It wasn't working basically. Is it a clutch in programming when you, when you don't get things working? So what we did is we worked with Resurrect um, and with Google got a very nice API. And I collaborated with Ashok Popat, uh, giving him the feedback loop on Sanskrit specific errors. Um, in their engine. So I thought rather let a company like Google throw lots of resources at solving this problem, because OCR, computer vision is really complicated and you need massive resources to do it very accurately. So it's got up to a level where I would say it's um, above, above human, um, well, okay, it's close to human, uh, close to a very high level human accuracy. Um, and it's definitely faster. And let's demonstrate it quickly. Um, so. What's nice about it is it works with the clipboard in the browser. So I'm just going to paste some. Okay, there was some Sanskrit in my clipboard. Oh, there it is. So this is just a photograph or scan um, at quite a low DPI. And you can check it for errors. I'll reward anyone who finds an error. Okay, there might be an error. There. Okay, pretty accurate, which everyone agrees. So, this is browser-based. It's, it's got Tesseract and the Google Vision API um, together. And then we're working with Google AI team to, if, if scholars report errors, we basically feed it back directly to Google. And then they improve it, hopefully. It doesn't always, it's not always an instant fix, like if it was Tesseract. Um, Tesseract, so Tesseract was originally pretty accurate, but much slower, because it uses a lot of resources to, to process. And now um, Google's just, gotten so good, so this, and this is being actively used by a lot of the digitization communities, and we're going to be upgrading it. Um, I know that a lot of people wanted it to do documents. Is it a Google one, or is it a... It's a mixture of two. It's Tesseract and Google, and it will all this. This is, it runs on Node.js, for those who want to get geeky about it. Okay. So this was the, um, the second recent project. We also announced it on Indology, and it's been relatively um, well engaged by the Sanskrit community. Um, and it does IAST and it does Devanagari. Um, and it understands Sanskrit as a language, um, not just as a script, not just Devanagari as a script. So it understands context and edges and um, all the things it needs to. Keeps improving. This is the nice thing about using cloud technologies. You, you, know, you don't have to upgrade it. This was a reference um, in my fifth year at ANU. I was um, reading Panini. I thought I was a bit nuts, but um, it was fun. And um, it's really complex stuff. So I made like a program as reference because it's very programmatic. Should we keep the questions for after, or do you want to interrupt the discourse and then should we 
let it flow, and then we just write your questions down, and then we'll I'll do them in um, reverse order or first in, first out. Okay. So this is brutal Panini research. So now at the Bangkok conference, I was at lovely um, Panini 2.0, and I was very inspired, and I didn't want to duplicate what they did. So um, it's similar; it's got some overlap. But then what we did is I got this permission um, from the copyright holders from. Um, Faso, basically, is, um, uh, you'll see that this is the, um, so we've got, okay, so the, Valentine is, was there out of copyright, we digitized that. We've got a team of volunteers that are pretty good at um, doing sort of, well, we didn't digitize it, we just um, snippeted it into small bite-sized image. It hasn't been fully digitized yet. But where we could digitize, we did digitize. And then we took some from the Ahtagyayi 2.0 project, that was a little bit, and then from Ramanath Sharma, we, we've also got uh, permission to use um, his work, which is phenomenal um, work um, for some of, some of his work. And um, uh, we had taken from many different sources. We also got audio recordings because the sounding of, of this literature was very important in the tradition. So I'm not sure if the audio is connected. Well, let's try that. But for, you know, for what it's worth, you've got the full... Um, it's got a bit of... I don't think it's coming through the system, I think it's not connected. But you just have to believe me that it does chant uh, quite well, everything. And it's just a consolidated reference with a, with a search. Now, when you're studying um, Panini, the search is really, really useful. So, um, um, you can search, you know, ad infinitum, and then it's, it understands um, to look through the translations and the definitions. And it was very useful for myself, and now I think a lot of other uh, tertiary students are using it. Um, if anyone has suggestions for improvements, I'm very, very open ears. Um, and we were happy with this. This is also relatively reasonable. And then um, the DLI, the Digital Library of India. The reason we did this, um, it's okay, I, I think we'll skip the video. It's, it's, it's totally fine, it's totally fine. I'll, I'll submit it. <laughs> the reason we did the DLI was um, the government site didn't go deeply into the documents. So once again, we worked with Cloud Vision. We threw everything onto the Google uh, service, and then um, we've got a collaboration also with Google for storage. So it's 31 point something terabytes, which would cost a fortune only to store. So we threw that onto the cloud, and then we just um, wrote some smart scripts that are using the Google Cloud Vision to understand this. And it allows you to do quite deep searches. Now, DLI is very, very useful. And in our bigger project, there's a lot of rep info we're going to cross-reference to. Um, and um, I wanted to just have this, that it was available in an accessible way. So this is all, I'll do the demo um, for you in a, in a second. Um, it's a DLI mirror. Now, archived it all, or is partially done one. And then the government one is uh, up and down, and then it's in transformation. So it's going through different evolutions. Um, so it wasn't that reliable, it went through a long period of reliability. So, um, yeah, you don't even need to spell it correctly because it will um, intuit for the um, dynamics. And um, it should be quite fast. Now we're searching 31 terabytes of data in about four seconds. And probably it would be two seconds if, if I wasn't running through my mobile. Um, and then, of course, you've got everything there. Um, all the PDFs, and you can do what you want with them. And then we've got all the metadata and the bibliographical info. Um, and this is also being used, I think some people use this and the government one and the archive, but there's different advantages. But it was something that I wanted to have. Um, it's got all of the, in theory, all of the out of copyright books that have been digitized. Not all, but a large percent. It's kind of like a mini Google Books of academia and uh, institutions in India. And it's got some phenomenal. If you're looking for something really random, like a needle in a haystack. So with the cloud search, that needle in the haystack, that's the whole thing that the cloud search is good at. It's good at um, finding needles in a haystack. And so it was like a no-brainer to do this, and um, we did it. And once again, shared it with Indology, and people seem to be using it, which makes us happy. Um, and then, OK. So this I actually presented in Bangkok. We, we're busy revising it now. It's our text-to-speech engine. And we're going to make it as an API that anyone can just call. 
We took Mary TTS, um, the German AI Institute um, <coughs> engine for text-to-speech, and then it works well for single words, um, and in theory for sentences, um, it can work. We just didn't focus on sentences because it was an individual word um, approach. Um, I can't demo it, but it's working. You can all go on our dictionary sites and see it. Um, so we're basically doing that as an API that will be a public API. Also be put on uh, one of the cloud services, and then people can have audible Sanskrit wherever they want, um, and that can be useful, um, um, especially considering Sanskrit was not a written language until recent history, about 2000 years, it's really um, written down, or the older history wasn't. So our moonshot we're working on, this is a collaboration with Wikimedia Foundation, and um, that's where we're beginning, um, because it overlaps with some of their um, objectives, and they obviously have very deep pockets, and um, great skills and abilities, and I met with um, the team in Cape Town, they had a, a Wikimedia conference. Uh, so we want to put the extent Sanskrit literature on, online. It's a moving target because as I speak, this presentation, some literature has been decayed and destroyed somewhere. You know, it's like a global warming, you know, if you talk about it and we already got warmer. So, but we're gonna do it with two, um, okay, so how much literature is there? Well, some people say, um, this was, from um, Sheldon Pollock's <laughs> estimate was 30 million um, manuscripts. That's a huge number, and it's in his, it's his reference, not mine, otherwise it would sound like way too much. It's in Language of the Gods, if anyone wants to see it. So what's happened is um, Latin and Greek have had it done. You know, you've got C on L and PLG, and they've done almost all the extant literature, and that's your classics, you know, for mm -hmm. European classics, and hasn't been done for Sanskrit. And um, I really feel that you know we should all work together and this, all these tools should make this happen that in, in the next, say, decade or five years, we can have extant Sanskrit literature in digital form online. So I see it as quite an insolvable problem without two things. So um, it needs crowdsourcing. There's no way you can do it as an individual effort. Even if Oliver Helwig lived a thousand years, <laughs> it would not happen. Um, and we've got to use um, neural networks, cognition neural networks. So what we can do with the AI is we can do automatic breaking of the Sunday, and I think we can get up to 99%. We can do automatic passing of the data in grammatical tag tagging and get to very high accuracy. We can do automatic census and figuration and also get very accurate, and we can definitely do translation. So if, uh, with convolutional neural network, as we have more data, it's gonna get more accurate. And eventually it's going to be so accurate that um, you know, it's, you're not going to notice it anymore. So this is a moonshot. I'm busy, we're busy working on it. We've got some um, it's parallel work in, in, um, in operation. Um, we should have something to present at the next, when's the next conference in three years? Um, <laughs> so I should be able to present something at the next conference on that project. And that's my um, email. If anyone wants to reach me, we've got... The end of the demo. Thank you very much. Questions for us? Easy ones, please. Thank you. Wow. Um, two questions. So, do you have um, any thoughts on providing an API for Google Vision OCR? So, I yeah. have my own experience setting up. But my that. Google Cloud account recently yeah. expired, I imagine yeah. we have a more stable... I think we could, we could do that. Um, yeah. If you send an email, it, um, I think we could put it in the pipeline, sure. There's no reason why we can't do that. Um, it, would be a, it wouldn't be like a public, I mean, it would be free of charge, but we would be, um, it would be basically on an invitation basis. <coughs> um, but yeah, we could do that for you, sure. There's no, I see no technical reason why it's, it's not feasible. Um, but yeah, we just don't want like, to, the whole world doing it because then the resources would get stretched. And Google's generosity to us would also be um, challenged. So we want to use it specifically for. So yeah, sure, we can do that. With pleasure. Oh yeah, sure. Um, when it comes to the CNN models that you're going to use for your segmentation, yeah. Do you imagine uh, using domain-specific, uh, so models trained for a particular subcore group? Uh, you want to get up to very high accuracy. I think you're going to need to yes. specialize and not use yes. one. We would, we would model what's already been done successfully with languages like 
English. I mean, like English has got so much data. So Asante is just another language. It's got nuances like Sandy that English doesn't have. But um, we would use whatever. It's a moving because it's constantly improving with Moore's law and um, so much research happening with AI. There was just a publication of um, um, DeepMind um, basically doing the Greek manuscripts with missing letters where there was total, um, much more accurate than humans now. So um, I think with crowdsourcing and AI, our archive project, it's the only way to achieve it. There's no other way. Um, like Elon Musk said, like, if you want to get to Mars, you've got to have reusable rockets. There's no other way. So it's the same. Like, it's a, for me, it's because my background is from computer science to Sanskrit. Um, I can't see any other way to easily solve that problem. And I do see it as a solvable problem, just a difficult problem. Um, it's difficult because the data's got a high noise to signal ratio. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of issues with data. And then also, um, well, there's a limited pool of scholars who can give a high quality um, curating of, um, of, of and tagging. And, you know, you can get a lot of people who say they know Sanskrit, but to the level that you want to do it, on, on say, Oliver's level of tagging, um, but we've got a way of um, incentivizing people that's in the pipeline for the project. So let's see how it goes. Sure. Any more questions? Um. Uh, do you have any estimate of uh, the annotated data that you need for tag, uh, the tag data uh, for developing the past? Um, you I mean, machine it, learning. Well, how much more data do we need to, to do it? I think maybe 10 times more like, than it's currently available. We, we don't have any. No, no, you're, you're talking about for... For the parser. Oh, for parsing. Um, maybe, um, yeah, more data you have, the better. So, so well, I, I, don't, I don't know, I can't estimate until we've started that project. But, but the more data, the better. I don't know, maybe yes, you could guess. What about this segmentation? Yes. How much data do you need for segmentation? Um, I don't know, actually, at the moment. I don't know. The, the data that is available with Oliver Henrik's DCS data. No. Oh, the DCS data is like 3.2 million yeah. words. So if so you use all that data, yeah. is it possible it's to... It's possible to build a rudimentary system that is maybe 80% um, accurate. 80%? I think so, yes. So... <laughs> That's my estimate. And if we use the 80-20 rule, then you need... No, but we're going to have a lot of data. That's the, the whole idea is to, so, to have the data. So if, if I have whole Sanskrit corpus annotated, then I can build a machine translation. Yes. I can use, no, what, what, try to understand what I'm saying. Yeah. If the whole Sanskrit corpus, thousand times whatever Greek. Yeah, so 30 million. Um, if if everything is manually tagged, then you can no, build a machine learning system. <laughs> no, it's not going to be manually tagged. Um, it's going to be assisted tag, that means humans will be involved, but the tools will speed up the process, basically. Just like we can, we so, can so how much is needed for bootstrapping? Uh, I, I don't know at the moment how much data, because we haven't done that part of the project. We're doing the formative phase. Then we'll, I mean, I can tell you for, like the frequency, we've, it's, it, the, the data is useful, but I can't speak about unknowns that we haven't done it yet. It's just hypothetical. Maybe Oliver Helbig could give a, like, a more ac accurate estimate, because He's, he's the best with, with that. But I mean, um, he's... So, maybe if you have, like, the DCS, it's a very good starting point, basically. But it's not tagged to the detail that we're going to have our data tagged to. Um, like, Peter Schaff's tagging is much more detailed. Oliver's tagging is just suited for his particular need with DCS, basically. Which, which tagging is better? No, so I think the Sanskrit library was Sanskrit. more detailed, like the Samasas were what okay. type of compound, and then Oliver doesn't okay, Peter, care about what type, he just says compound. He doesn't say what type of compound. So Peter Schaff goes into the, it's like the gold standard. So I would use a standard like that for the tagging because that level of detail is very useful linguistically to understand meaning and context. The type of compound can make or break the meaning you know, in the Vedic or classical. I hope, I'm sorry about the questions I can't answer about the amount of data. No, no, I was, I was yeah. just joking. Sure. But it's possible. Do you think? Yeah. Okay. Next <laughs> question. Any more questions? Okay, so let's thank everyone. Thank you. So, thank you.